Father, thank you so much for Tim and his willingness. Thank you for your timing in bringing him to this area, even at this time when we had need. I pray, Father, that you would use him in mighty ways to bring your word, to touch lives, that we may learn and we may have a stronger desire to serve you as a result. We pray a special anointing on him and in a supernatural way speak through him. And we pray this in your precious name. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, everyone. It's a great, great privilege to... Uh, to be here, I'm reminded of a, uh, a verse that the Apostle Paul shared in Romans 15, 4, when he said, everything that was written in the past was written for our instruction so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. I personally believe that uh, all of this is God's word. I believe that the Older Testament points ahead to the one that God would provide for us as a Savior, Jesus. But today what we want to do is look at an Older Testament story, the story of the Exodus. And while we're not going to be able to uh, exhaustively look at that story today, what we do want to do is consider one amazing truth, a relevant truth, that emerges from that story that can, I believe, make a significant difference in our lives and in our perspective as we relate to God. So with that, let me just pray that God might stir hope in us as we give attention to his word this morning. Father in heaven, I do ask that right now you would speak from out of this amazing story that took place on the stage of history thousands of years ago. And that you might help us to receive from you and then to appropriate and apply to our lives what you desire for us. In Jesus' name, amen. One day there was a woman in an airport who decided to pick up a newspaper and a small bag of cookies while she was waiting for her connection. She began reading her newspaper, and she heard a rustling sound, and she uh, lowered her paper to discover that a well-dressed man in a suit and tie was uh, helping himself to a cookie. <laughs> Perturbed, she, uh, she reached for one herself and, and began to eat it. Several minutes later, she hears a rustling sound again. She drops her paper, and she sees that this same man in a suit and tie is helping himself to another cookie. So she, uh, perturbed, reaches for one herself and takes it. You guessed it, after a couple more minutes, there was another rustling sound. And as if to add insult to injury... This man breaks the cookie in two, eats half himself, and slides the other half to her. Well, she's, she's fuming now. In just a couple of minutes, she heard uh, over the, the loudspeaker at her gate that uh, her flight was going to be boarding. And so, still fuming, she reaches into her purse to grab her boarding pass. And when she opens her purse... She sees an unopened package of cookies. <laughs> the unopened package of cookies that she had purchased a little earlier. <laughs> Faulty assumptions can lead to misunderstanding. Isn't that true? Faulty assumptions can lead to misunderstanding. And one of the things that we want to give some thought to this morning is it's possible for people of faith, for people evaluating the claims of Christ and evaluating faith, it's possible to develop faulty assumptions about the way God should lead in our lives. 
We see this truth play out early on in the story of the Bible. If you have a Bible with you, you could turn to the book of Exodus. This passage is also going to be on the back of the bulletin folder, and uh, uh, it's, the Lord willing, going to be on the screen this morning as well. Exodus is the second book in the Bible. There's Genesis, and then there's Exodus. And as the narrative of Exodus begins, God's people are captive in Egypt. Pharaoh's a tyrant, and he's ruthlessly dealing with the Hebrew people. Israel is languishing under oppressive slavery. The people lament with groans. And, and, now watch this, and their groans were heard by God. This is what we read in Exodus 6. There's Ann and I. (laughs) This is what we read in Exodus 5 and 6. I've heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. Exodus 6, 5 and 6. Wonderfully, God hears the cries of his people. And he has both the power and the desire to intervene and to do something about their situation. Now, now, the question you may be asking this morning is this. But does he hear my cries? In my distress, does God really Hear me. In your case, the slavery uh, that holds you captive might involve slavery to addictive patterns or slavery to financial worries or employment challenges or slavery to fear or slavery to cynicism. The slave masters in your life may not be Egyptian but they're real to you. The story of the exodus out of Egypt is a story loaded, friends, with relevant truth. It's a pivotal drama in the larger biblical story. It's a beautiful and powerful story that's set on the stage of history. It really happened. It's not a fable. It's not a legend. It really happened. In God's unfailing love, he leads people he loves from captivity toward freedom. Now watch this. But he may not lead in a straight line. But he may not lead in a straight line. And honestly, that's where there can be some misunderstanding and some frustration. As we're going to see this morning... God may lead by way of detour on purpose. On purpose, he may lead by way of detour. This brings us to the portion of the Exodus story that we want to focus on this weekend. It's in Exodus uh, 13, verses 17 to 22. And this is what we read. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines. Watch this next phrase. Although that was near. We're going to see what's meant by that in just a little bit. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt, equipped for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. Let me just stop parenthetically. This whole idea of carrying Joseph's bones with them might sound kind of eek to us, 
But the issue was it was a reminder to Israel of God's faithfulness to them in the past. Before they had gone to Egypt, God had sent Joseph down, one who had a heart for the Hebrew people because he was one of them. And he was uniquely positioned to help them during a time of great famine in the land. Moving on, and they moved on from Succoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them. Um, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. At some point in school, when we were growing up, we learned that the shortest distance between two points is what? Wow, a lot of geometry students here. That's just wonderful. That's right. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. However, as God exercises leadership in our lives, and certainly in this exodus, we observe that he doesn't always lead in a straight line. He at times leads by way of a detour. We might call it a zigzag, a real circuitous detour. Our instinctive expectation is that a straight line is the most efficient path, but God's leadership is not so predictable. Sometimes with God, the most meaningful way to get from captivity to freedom is by means of a detour. And here's why. When God leads, he's just as committed to revelation as he is to destination. And I want you to think about this. When God leads, he's just as committed to revelation as he is to destination. In other words, through the whole of life, God wants to show himself to believers. He wants to reveal more of himself to us, more of his heart, more of his steadfast love, more of his holiness, more of his justice, more of his mercy. He wants to reveal more and more of himself to us. And now think about this. Frequently, it's in the detours that we become most aware of God's presence. God certainly led his people in a detour during the exodus from Egypt. Look again at verses 17 and the first part of verse 18. Uh, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country though that was shorter, for God said if they face war, they might change their minds, return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. Now, there is a, um, there's a screen here. This is what is considered a, a, a traditional route. It's not exacting. We don't have an exacting route. But this is by many scholars, considered to be the traditional route of the Exodus. Now, the people of Israel were in captivity in Egypt. See the Nile Delta up there? There was an, a region called Goshen, and that's where they were, and God was going to lead them to Canaan. There was a straight line. There was an international highway at that time that went from Goshen in the Nile Delta to Canaan. It was a straight line route. But look at the way God led the people of Israel. And the question we want to ask ourselves is why? Why did he lead them on such a circuitous route? On the map here, there is a gulf that's going up on, uh, on the left side of the Sinai Peninsula between Egypt and what is now Saudi Arabia, uh, there's 
there's a gulf there that's called the Gulf of Suez. And on the right, going up the Sinai Peninsula, there's a gulf called the Gulf of Suez. Now, at the bottom, we have there the Red Sea. What's important for us to recognize is both gulfs were also referred to as the Red Sea. And so, in other words, what is thought to have happened someplace on that Gulf of Suez, someplace along there, Israel had crossed the Red Sea. God had promised to lead his people to Canaan, to a really good land flowing with milk and honey. You see it there in the upper right. Israel left Goshen. They're on their way. But look at the route that historians think Israel may have traveled. Now, again, I just need to say, we can't with certainty say that this was the exact route, particularly as it relates to the exact spot where Israel crossed the Red Sea, but we do know that Israel did indeed travel south toward Mount Sinai during the time of the wilderness wanderings. Can you imagine if Moses had a GPS with him? <laughs> recalculating, recalculating. <laughs> Please take the next exit, yeah. recalculating. Why would God lead Israel in such a circuitous route? There are a couple of clues in the Exodus narrative. The first clue is in verse 17. It says, when Pharaoh let the people go, I'm reading now from the NIV here. Uh, the text on the bulletin is from the ESV, and that's what we read from earlier, but this is now in the NIV. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country. Listen to this. Though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. Now, here's something to know about that international highway. It was punctuated with military garrisons all along the way, and it was an area that at that time was populated by the Philistines. I mean, like Chicago Bear fans. I mean, the, the Philistines, right, right, right there. Um, uh, at that time, at that time in history, at that time in history, the Philistines were thought to be the most brutal people on the face of the earth. Goliath was a Philistine. And what God was doing was acting to protect his covenant people by sending them on a detour. But he was doing more than merely protecting his people. The living God that we've come to worship this morning is a God who knows us well. He knows us intimately. And God knew the people of Israel. And though it's true that they disdained their slavery, it was also true that slavery was all they knew. Think about this. They'd been in Egypt for 400 years. Slavery was all they knew. Now think about that. They didn't know what it was to be free. So in the face of formidable challenge and possible threatening opposition, they were at least vulnerable to defaulting back to the only thing they had known, slavery in Egypt. Now let's hit the pause button. Because this isn't just a, uh, it's not just a history narrative. I believe God wants to speak to us this morning. Maybe you've seen this pattern play out in someone's life. Or perhaps, when you're brutally honest with yourself, you've seen this pattern in your own life. For example, you could uh, encounter God and, and, and you're drawn to him and you begin to take steps in following Jesus. You're experiencing new measures of freedom from some pattern, perhaps, that held you captive in the past. 
And then one day, you find yourself faced with a setback. Or with a uh, very formidable challenge. Some sort of loss. And you lose heart. You lose a job. You lose a relationship. You lose a loved one. If you're not alert, the setback can steal resolve and you can become at least vulnerable to defaulting back into old patterns. Isn't that true? In other words, you become inclined to return to slavery in Egypt. God knows us. No one loves you like God does. No one loves you like God does. And God knows us well. And because He loves us, there are times when He may lead us on a road where retreat isn't an option, where there's no chance for turning back. That's how He led Israel in His love for them. Again, here's that truth that winds through this story. Well, I'm just going to say it out loud. (laughs) When God leads, he's just as committed to revelation as he is to destination. Now, please don't misunderstand me there. God wants to take us someplace. God has a destination to which he wants to lead us. But that's not his only objective as he leads in our lives. He's wanting all along the way to reveal more and more of himself to us. God was very present with his people in the Exodus. He was showing them his protection, his provision, and his presence. He was revealing himself to his people in the detour. Look at verses 21 and 22. I think I can go back. Now I'm ready to roll. Well, maybe I'm not, so... (laughs) He was revealing himself to his people in the detour. Verses 21 and 22. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. He was directing them. His presence was unmistakable. He was always before them. And here's the deal. God was preparing to show them in an unforgettable demonstration of his power and covenant love, his leadership in their lives. And now watch this, friends. And it wasn't going to happen at a festival. It would happen when their backs were against a wall. Now, I'm going to go because I think there's the map again. They had come down from the Nile Delta to the Red Sea and Pharaoh and his army had chased after them to that point. And when Israel heard Pharaoh and his army coming after them, many of them began to panic. While you're looking at the map, I want to tell you what God said to Moses in the very next verses of chapter 14. God directed Moses to have the Israelites turn back and to camp near the sea. And God told Moses Pharaoh would pursue them. In other words, they were going to be pinned between Pharaoh's army and the Red Sea. Now, why would God do that? The key verse is Exodus 14, 4, where God says, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. Here's what God says, but I will gain glory for myself. But I will gain glory for myself. For the sake of his glory, God positioned his people to see indisputable evidence of his unique power to save. So he didn't lead as we might have expected, as we might have expected. He pinned them against the sea so that there was no turning back. 
Now, while that was God's perspective, Israel wasn't real fond of that idea. (laughs) More to the point, they were nervous and they were ticked. And they complained and complained and complained. This was a people who had turned griping into a varsity sport. (laughs) They complained and they complained. And speaking for God, this is how Moses responded in Exodus 14, 13 and 14. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. You need only to be still. Or as the ESV says, you need only to be silent, (laughs) to wait on God, to wait on God, because, now think about this, everyone, isn't this true? God can do more in a moment with a word of his mouth than we could ever accomplish in our fretting and busyness. Isn't that true? And in the very next movement, Movement of the story, God tells Moses to stretch out his hand over the Red Sea. Ah. And it parts. And Israel walks through between two walls of water to salvation on the other side. And then God ensures their safety by enclosing the sea over their oppressors who were chasing from behind. So what does this historical story have to do with us. My sense is that in a group this size, there could be people who walked in here today. You may be here today feeling like you're on a long detour and you're inwardly feeling "Mm, off course. God is reminding you today that he's not forgotten you. He has not forgotten you. For those of you who came in today, who maybe, you know, you're just not sure where you stand with God. You know, you're not sure that there's ever been a a point in your life where you've made some kind of decisive yes to Jesus. First of all, what we'd want you to know in this place, you're always welcome here. You're welcome here to ask your questions, to bring your curiosity about God, about faith. You're always welcome. Welcome at Lakeside. But this is what I want to say to you today. This story is on the stage of history, a historical story of redemption. Redemption involving God's leading from captivity to freedom. In fact, in Exodus 15, in the very next chapter, there's a whole song that's penned about the redemption of God. In fact, in Exodus 15, 13, it says, You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. See, the story of redemption runs like a beautiful thread through the whole of the Bible. God is a redeeming God. And this is a story of redemption. When we get to the New Testament, we're introduced to the one who was God's appointed deliverer, redeemer, who would once and for all redeem those who would believe, who would uh, pay our debt. I look forward to having you meet my uh, wife, Anne, in the weeks ahead. Uh, Ann and I have been married for 38 years, and uh, for our 25th anniversary, we decided to celebrate the whole year. <laughs> we did. In as many ways as we knew how, 
we celebrated the silver anniversary the whole year. But on the appointed night, June 14th, we went to a restaurant in downtown Minneapolis that was way out of our tax bracket. <laughs> but this was a special occasion. It's our 25th anniversary. And I was honestly pretty much able through the whole of the dinner, we, and we had just a glorious dinner. The food was magnificent. The conversation was wonderful. We reflected back over 25 years and all the grace of God in our lives. And I was able to put out of my mind that inevitable moment when the waitress would come with that little black folder. <laughs> and she approached our table after a couple of hours, and I swallowed hard, and I started to reach for it. And the waitress says to Ann and I, do you know a James and Karna? I said, well, yeah, it's my brother and my sister-in-law. She said, well, they just called to say, dinner is on them tonight. <laughs> <laughs> What's for dessert? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> There's just something wonderful when someone picks up the tab for you, right? When someone pays a debt on your behalf. Friends, listen to me. I will never get over this. Jesus Christ picked up the tab on my whole life. I will never get over that. At the cross, in history, Jesus picked up the tab on my entire life. And if you came in today not really knowing where you stand with God, I'll tell you this, in whatever time God gives me at Lakeside, there, was, there is nothing that I'd rather do then sit down and hear your story and listen to you and to hear your questions and to interact with you about how you could know you have a relationship with the Creator, Redeemer, God, the living God. It's also possible that into this place today there were a number of people, you're followers of Jesus. At some point you trusted Him. And yet, as you've come into today, you, well, you've got some honest questions about his leading in your own life. And you're here, here feeling like you're on a long detour. And you find yourself a long way from where you thought God was going to lead you. And I just want to say to you this morning, friend, God has not left you. He's aiming to shape and refine you through the detour. His longing in all of this is that you would come to relationally know him better. That's his longing. You see, God doesn't always lead in a straight line, in part, because in the detour, he's testing your faith and training you to desire him more than the blessing you crave. Many years ago, a friend of mine introduced me to a story. as a friend who uh, I think is familiar to some of you here, Tom Nebel. Tom and I graduated from high school together in Sturgeon Bay, and I saw him come to Christ. I saw him grow in Christ. He followed Ann and I to Denver Seminary, and we spent a lot of great time together there. And it's just been thrilling for me to watch God use my friend, my high school friend who I saw come to Christ, to use him over the last 40 years. Tom introduced me to this story about a, an officer named John Blanchard and a young woman named Hollis Maynell. It's a story of romance from out of World War II. Here's the story. His interest in her had begun 13 months before in a Florida library. Taking a book off the shelf, he found himself intrigued, not with the words of the book, but with the notes penciled in the margin. The soft handwriting reflected a thoughtful soul and an insightful mind. In the front of the book, he discovered the previous owner's name, Miss Hollis Maynell. With time and effort, he located her address. She lived in New York City. He wrote her a letter introducing himself and inviting her to correspond. The next day, he was shipped overseas for service in World War II. During the next year and one month, the two grew to know each other through the mail. A romance was budding through their correspondence. Blanchard requested a photograph 
but she refused. She felt that if he really cared, it wouldn't matter what she looked like. When the day finally came for him to return from Europe, they scheduled their first meeting, 7 p.m., at the Grand Central Station in New York City. You'll recognize me, she wrote, by the red rose I'll be wearing on my lapel. So at 7 o'clock, he was in the station looking for a girl whose heart he loved, but whose face he'd never seen. This is how Mr. Blanchard describes what happened. A young woman was coming towards me, and she was beautiful. Her blonde hair lay back in curls from her delicate ears. Her eyes were blue as flowers. In her pale green suit, she was like springtime come alive. I started toward her, entirely forgetting to notice that she was not wearing a rose. As I moved, a small smile curved her lips. Almost uncontrollably, I made one step closer to her, and then I saw Hollis Maynell. She was standing almost directly behind the girl. She was a, a woman um, with straggly hair tucked under a worn hat. She was hefty, and her thick feet were thrust into low-heeled shoes. The girl in the green suit was walking quickly away. I felt as though I was split in two. So keen was my desire to follow the woman in the green suit, and yet so deep was my longing for the woman whose spirit has tru had truly companioned me and upheld my own. And there she stood. Her pale, plump face was gentle and sensible. Her gray eyes had a warm and kindly twinkle. I did not hesitate. My fingers gripped the small, worn, blue leather copy of the book that was to identify me to her. This would not be what I expected, but it would be something precious, a friendship for which I had been and must ever be grateful. I squared my shoulders and saluted, held out the book to the woman, choked up somewhat by my own disappointment. I'm Lieutenant John Blanchard, ma'am, and you must be Miss Maynell. I'm so glad you could meet me. May I take you to dinner? The woman's face broadened into a tolerant smile. I don't know what this is about, son, but the young lady in the green suit who just walked by you begged me to wear this rose on my coat. And she said, if you were to ask me out to dinner, I should go ahead and tell you that she is waiting for you in the big restaurant across the street. She said... It was some kind of test. Test. It was a test designed to see if his heart was honestly devoted to the one who had companioned him, the one he'd not yet seen with his own physical eyes. Friends, in the detours of life, God may be testing our faith. Though we've not seen him yet with our physical eyes, he's looking for people who desire him and whose devotion toward him is wholehearted and genuine and authentic. He's not capricious about this. Listen to this. It's for our good. It's for our greater joy that God challenges and tests our faith. You see... God doesn't always lead in a straight line, in part because in the detour, he's testing your faith and training you to desire him more than the blessing you crave. So friend, as heart to heart, as eye to eye as I can be, so in the detour that you may be on in your journey, be still and wait for God. The Lord himself will fight for you. You need only to be still. Father in heaven, I thank you for Lakeside Community Church, and I thank you for your steadfast, unfailing love toward this community of believers. 
God, uh, 18 to 20 years ago, you sovereignly established this church in this place with a vision to introduce as many people as possible on the lake shore to the redeeming love of Jesus. And God, I just pray today for those who came into this place who are on some type of a zigzag or a detour. Lord, I pray that you'd give them grace to not lose heart, to trust you. And God, for all of us, I pray you'd be training us to desire you more than the blessing or the outcome that we crave. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.